we're going to pick up where we left off and talk a bit about the new anti-malware integration. And I'll be upfront and honest with you. I just recently started this, so I do not know this backwards and forwards yet. This is as, as new to me as it is to you. That makes two of us. <laughs> so we're going to talk about, and I'm just probably going to go through some of the demos and explain how this works and show how this can work in PowerShell. Now, the, the premise with all of this is we no longer want to have to rely on traditional virus scanners and they get a file base to detect, hey, it's something bad here. Because a lot of things, as you all know, can happen that never touch the disk. And so in Windows 10, if I'm correct, yep. uh, we have a feature that will look at what's happening and tell you, hey, no, this is good, this is bad, without relying on traditional ways of having to make sure that something is stuck to file. Let's get rid of Rick. You didn't need to say that, right? No, I think I'm good. Now, one thing that's uh, actually come up as a couple of questions is people are looking at their laptops and saying, hey, I got a bunch of these parameters from the transcripting and a bunch of these things. So everything we've talked about today and actually everything not including this anti-malware interface exists on the PowerShell v5 preview and also has been brought down to the v4 update that was offered. And so most of this stuff you can roll out right away and start protecting your systems. So, I think I'm going to do this the right way. So we have kind of go through a, a series of you know bad things that might happen to you. You might have a, a function here, and these are all going to be really benign. I have to do the whole script, not just one line. All right, so that may or may not be detected as something bad has happened that has grabbed my machine. And if I have skipped a step, we jump in and tell me that I forgot to do something. But this is, if, if you're kind of antivirus, this isn't a script, you can write a signature for this, right? If somebody says, write a post poem in a PowerShell script, maybe that's a virus. That's an easy thing to write a sig for. So if you're an attacker, how do you start thinking about how to prevent this from being detected? And then we're to the nefarious invoke expression. Now I can write it. I can put in any arbitrary command that I want here. You so actually see this. If you ever look at the HTML source of a, of a site that includes advertising, you see that last technique all the time where they're doing, you know, open a, a single quoted string, SCRI, and then append it with another one, PT, to prevent ad blockers that are blocking script. So this is the next step that attackers take, trying to evade static signatures. So now, they, because the attacker may say, oh, yeah, I know someone's going to have a signature that's going to look for right host, so I'm going to break it up and use invoke expression, and I can get around that. A hack, and, you know, it's always a, a race, right, between you and the nefarious evildoer, and go ahead. So what, what a great example. Here is base 64 is like, a very common encoding format. Now, as an attacker moves to this, it still writes the same, exact same code, right post home. But this is now going through base64, invoke expression, and actually running. But anti-malware guys have caught on. If you have, let's say, for example, a VB malware that does this base64 encoding, they literally have re-implemented base64 decoding. And it's not running VB at the time, it's just a thing that they're emulating in their engines to decode base64 chunks and try to take a look for signatures inside that base64. So taking then to the next level, if I am Mr. Bad Guy, I'm going to further try to obfuscate the code and again using invoke expression, same result though, you know, 
I got you. So the, this is a technique called XOR encryption. People also call it encraction because it's taking basically a key, a simple thing here, one, two, three, and is applying that to all the bytes in the string. And the unique thing about XOR-based encryption is that you do it twice and then you get back to the original string. So what they did before creating this script was take a string, take its bytes, XOR each one of them by this number, so then when you go backwards, and then they convert it to base64. So when you take those steps backwards, you still get pwned. And this is a point where anti-malware is basically like, we can't, we don't know, they're not gonna look up what that thing was and do XOR over the keys and bytes. So at this point, you're really starting to get in trouble in terms of anti-malware detecting any virus in any scripting language. Yeah, we're, <clears throat> and again, we're just using PowerShell because it's really easy and convenient to do stuff without having to do this in VB script or anything else, which would be much more complicated and, and involved. So here's another example. So you know what, I'm not even gonna bother me being the bad guy here, I'll play, I'll play the bad guy. <clears throat> I'm not even gonna bother trying to worry about something running locally, I'm gonna grab it and download it and run that command. So again, I can just use I can pull something from the internet using invoke web request and then <laughs> execute whatever it is that I have downloaded. And the end result is that it has locked up my computer. <laughs> we'll just do touch again. We don't who needs a pad there? Any anyway, so got ya. And at this point you can imagine a anti-malware vendor <coughs> writing the code to do that encryption stuff. You can imagine them spending a lot of time virtualizing, emulating the PowerShell engine, the BBScript engine, if they had kind of the infinite time of the sun. But you cannot write a signature to block a script that goes out to the internet and invokes it. That's the thing that we do from, from management sometimes. You just, you cannot block that. That's, at that point, you're out of the domain of what anti-malware can do. Because for, for all we know, this is actually a legitimate command, too. You could be wanting to invoke web requests and get something and then do something with the content, and it's perfectly legal. So how can you identify whether this is good or bad without running it? And here's the, the VB script equivalent. Kind of just shows that these same techniques are consistent for every language. Uh, people are doing this with C++, assembly language, PowerShell, Perl, VBScript, Python. This is not a new domain. Close some of these things here. Now, how many of you are old enough to remember the days of Melissa and I love you? Yeah, weren't those great days? Now they just write those things in PowerShell and that's why we're or micro, not we, Microsoft is taking uh, the initiative to make things easier to prevent those sorts of things. Question, um, could, could that just be captured in memory regardless of what mechanism it came in and be identified and stop there? Are you talking about the VB script or any of the examples? Or? All of the above. So the question was, if you're anti-malware trying to protect these kind of viruses, could you potentially know that it went to pastebin, got some content and ran it. So the challenge is there, all these applications and all these scripting languages that are downloading this content, it's really infeasible for an anti-malware product to go and literally scan all of memory continuously. And then if it did that, what I would do is I would say, I'll write half of it, wait till a scan passes and write the other half. And Remember, with all of this, we also have logging options now for us to capture all of this activity. So remember, we're assuming that something bad has happened or that we've been breached. So the, what we're hoping to do is just mitigate or do what we can to, in worst case, I suppose, go back and find out what went wrong and then try to fix it so it doesn't happen again. So just as a, as a question here, remember that Rick ASCII? You know, the fact that you could have invoked it interactively with a coded command from a website, 
that did uh, compression, they could have done encryption, you know, all these five layers of stuff. What do you think the chances that an antivirus product would have had a chance in hell of finding it? Zero. So that's what this, this anti-malware scan interface work is all about. You saw that amazing stuff that we just did with the script block logging, where every single time PowerShell gets asked, can you evaluate some new code? Because really what's happened in all these stages, PowerShell's been asked to evaluate some new code. It's ultimately PowerShell. So somebody types something in the command line, that's new code. That thing is running invoke web request, that's new code once you run invoke expression on it. Then I got this huge whack of binary data, decrypted it, ran invoke expression, that's new code. And what we saw in the event log was all this new code every single time it was being written. If you've had the misfortune, which most of you haven't, but if you have the misfortune to take a look at what anti-malware signatures actually look like, the vast, vast majority of these things are protections at this kind of encryption level. They realize that, sure, people are going to be able to evade it, but the best they can possibly do is look for some of these unique strings in the base64, or detect some common obfuscation techniques that people use. So that's really the state of the industry right now, despite the fact that so many anti-malware products have done, dumped you know, tons of man years into emulating DBScript and emulating PowerShell and doing that base 64 description, decryption. Yeah, so this last example then is a kind of combining all of these steps and is the most evil of all. And so if I run this as a script, I mean, you can't tell unless you are good at deciphering base 64. I know I'm not. But this is the result that now that we get, you see the, hopefully you can see the error message there that the script contains malicious content and has been blocked by your antivirus software. In this case, this is the result of the AMC stuff detecting, hey, you tried to grab something that is not good, and I'm not gonna allow you to do that, and so it blocks it from running. And I would get the same effect if I were trying to run each of these lines individually. So the magic of this is you saw that, and this is all about scripting transparency and PowerShell security transparency. So what you saw was that in the script block logging, we're logging every script block that is doing anything. Every time that the PowerShell engine is being asked to evaluate code, it's logged. So, so I'm going to walk through each line at a time. So each of these individual steps, kind of okay. What's in string now? What's in string? Uh, not strong. The current version of string. So that is the file that was downloaded. As you can see, we're just downloading a, a iCard test file, but it could have been something really bad. It could have been a Justin Bieber video or something. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I actually try to invoke it, then Windows says, oh, no, I'm not going to allow you to do that because that's bad. And this is, this is one of the important parts is that this anti-malware scan interface <clears throat> is not just a PowerShell thing. This is built into Windows 10. Any application can now opt into the scanning of its own content. So in Windows 10, it's PowerShell, VBScript, JScript. Now all of these, any application out there, any VBScript out there that's doing some of this kind of tomfoolery, now all the antimalware guys need to do is write signatures against the actually bad stuff instead of all of these obfuscators that they used to have to write to. So now they don't need to spend, you know, man years emulating engines when really the engine is just doing all that work for them. Uh, I think that's as far as we go with that, right? Yep. Anything, any other questions on that? Yeah. What, Lee, what do you intend to do if your Rick Astley skip scripts uh, starts to get flagged by printing malware? I plan to talk to the anti-Noir team and say, get real. Everyone loves yeah. Rick Askey. It's a more legitimate, are you, you know. Is, are you sorry, sharing question? Are you sharing that? Am I sharing Rick Askey? Yeah. Yeah, if you search for PowerShell HTML5 prototype, that gives you the URL.
So that's the question about one of the ways that we're taking steps in, in PowerShell and Windows 10. So that feature, anti-malware scan interface, is not available in the v4 update. That requires Windows 10. Because it's not just the anti-malware, like the Windows Defender guys that can write this thing. It's McAfee and anybody else um, can also plug in to this API. So we should see other vendors also coming onto this very quickly. If they're smart. Right. If they care about their customers. This will be a way for you to figure out which of your AV vendors to keep. If they want to be relevant. <coughs> So there's been a bunch of questions about what happens when I'm running a script that's doing script block logging and somebody spoofed up and they started typing in credentials. So we'll, let's talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> now if you saw, um, if you had the pleasure of being at Dave's session this morning, he did a great job of talking about, there's a, there's a technique in in security called public key cryptography. And the really the big thing to think about there is that the way that you encrypt your data is different than the way you decrypt it. So you can have somebody who's only allowed to encrypt data and they can't even back it back out once it's been encrypted. And then once it's been encrypted, then you can give it to somebody else and they have the unique role of only being able to decrypt it. Well, the decryptor can encrypt and decrypt, but the idea would be you'd have a bunch of machines that are allowed to encrypt. Nobody on those machines can actually decrypt this data. You forward all this data to, let's say, a centralized collector. They're, they're allowed to decrypt it. So your sensitive data, you can give to only people who are allowed to use it. Now, the way that protected event logging works is there's an open standard based off of the S-Mine protocol for email. So it's called the cryptographic message syntax. If there's an RFC out there and it's a bunch of great stuff. And it has a format for encrypting data, how to package it into an ASCII format, what the, the binary structure looks like. And so PowerShell has brought a bunch of that into the product proper. The first thing you need when you're doing protected event logging is the certificate that I was talking about is a way that you encrypt data and decrypt it. And so, these document encryption, there's a new type of certificate called document encryption. If you are working with PKI and setting up your own systems, this number will be important to you. If not, ignore it. This is now the understanding of this EKU is built into Windows 10 and above now. So what you, if you look at this certificate on a Windows 10, let's take a look what happens. So this is just the automation of running certrec with an input file with all the correct, um, all the correct parameters. But if you, if you had an Active Directory PKI, as long as you know the right uh, extensions, you could request a certificate that should generate that for you. Exactly. <clears throat> so what we can do here is we'll run Now on this machine, I just generated a new encryption certificate and I gave it the common name of, you know, uh, summit at leeholmes.com. <coughs> now on the certificate provider, I can take a look at all the certificates. There's a new dynamic parameter to show you ones that are just for document encryption. So you see here that there's, they're in the current user <coughs> store. And this one that's important here is the last one where And where does that document encryption cert parameter come from? Is that in V5, Windows 10 combination, or? The, 
the dynamic parameter of document encryption cert exists in, in PowerShell v5 and also the v4 update. There's one stage which I'll show you right now. Here's the actual certificate that was created by that command. So you'll see here that it's got the document encryption capability. The UI now shows this. If you were to run this on, let's say, PowerShell v5, push down to a, let's say, a 2K8 R2, 2K12 R2, you're not gonna necessarily see this. So we've got certificates now that I can encrypt data with and decrypt data with. The one thing I'll point out here is that you see, the certificate that I just got from running this thing, the one that's actually installed in my certificate provider, has the private key. So that means when somebody encrypts data with the certificate, I'm the person on this machine who can actually decrypt it. But that's not true. The certificate here doesn't have the private key, so if I can distribute this .sir file down to other machines, they won't be able to decrypt it, but they'll be able to use it for encryption. So do you want to give a demo of the actual commandlets? No, go ahead. Okay. You're already there again. Now, so we got, we got the certificate. Now, what does this encryption decryption stuff look like? I'll just ask a question. Last try. So the main idea behind the command list is that we've got three main commandlets for protecting and unprotecting the system-wide data. So protect CMS message is the one that anybody can do as long as they have access to the public key. So this is the one that you're giving out to your whole infrastructure, you're putting online on your web server, whatever. So you're Sending this thing every, everywhere, anybody can call this commandlet with that public key. So what I did here is I was able to say, protect this message to this certificate. And given that this is kind of one directional, saying who you're encrypting it to is really important because you might have a bunch of these public keys installed on a system. So deciding who's the one person or the one key that can actually decrypt it is important. 
you can provide multiple people in the, in the dash two, and any of them will be able to decrypt it. And they could also have been, for the two, it could have been the person, the name that you had in the certificate, right? And it could also be the path to the, well, I'm sorry, there you did the path to the certificate, or a thumbprint, if I remember right. Yep. So the idea behind Protect CMS Message is it goes, supports a bunch of different ways that you might want to refer to these things. One of the things that we thought about like very deeply on these commandlets is we, when people hear about encryption, they think about PKI and they think about their head exploding. And so we wanted to make sure that it was as easy as possible to, to support this functionality without necessarily having to deploy a PKI but allowing you to do it if you wanted to. And so for example, it will look in the local certificate provider for anything that supports document encryption. But also you saw this path thing here where you could say, I wanna keep these document encryption certificates on a, a shared path where I can update them really easily. Everybody can encrypt with that path. And then the minute I rotate that certificate, they're gonna get encrypted to the proper certificate. Now here's an example of the stuff that actually comes out with the, the CMS message commandlet. You can see here, there's lots of data, there's recipients. So this is one of the concerns that people have is I encrypt a thing, how do I know, like what's the right key that I used five years ago when I encrypted this? It's actually part of the standard of, of how these things are packaged. So when the unprotect CMS message commandlet comes into play, it was able to actually take a look at all that structure, figure out the right certificate to use, it looks into your private store for the private key, then it is able to decrypt this stuff. So the important point to think about, it's kind of lame to show you all on this computer because it doesn't really show a differentiation here on trust. But it's really useful when you start to think about what happens if I'm encrypting data and sharing it online or I'm I've got servers that I'm really concerned about. Your, your situation there of, I've got a script that might have creds in it. How do I maybe distribute this in such a way that only trusted people can decrypt it and run it? And those trusted people, that's what you handle by distributing the certificates properly to them. They'll be able to decrypt it and run it. Everybody else would just see either an encrypted blob or you might have a specific chunk of it that's encrypted. So let me, let me ask a kind of a usage case here. I'm totally off the top of my head. So if I am, because you just converted a simple text string, but I can run any command, like, you know, to get process, blah, 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 and protect it as a CMS message. Save that. Can I then export that to an XML file? That's a good question. By default, the protect and unprotect CMS message don't support objects. Uh, Dave's module supports objects, so that's a great way <clears throat> if you're looking for that functionality. Another approach is to do something like this. So the command, the command line name message is a key, your clue that it's just text that it's protecting. Correct? Correct. If, Whatever you pipe into it, it's assumed that you're looking for the string representation and it will encrypt basically what you saw. But if that's not what you're looking for, if you're looking for objects, here's an example of what you can do. <clears throat> you see here that I'm using a different form of the two where it's actually gonna look through my certificate provider for any document encryption certs that match this, the subject name of Summit. Yeah, so where I was going with this, and where you started, is let's say you have my public key, and you're gonna encrypt something, send it to me, and then I can unprotect CMS message. That's where I was right. going with that, and that's what I think you're doing here. So what I just did, what would you like to see? 
Yeah, oh, yes, 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 yes. yes. So what I just did here was I took, used export XML to create a file with objects. Then I ran protect CMS message on that. And so I can do, for example, get content of that file. Dollar dollar is an awesome way to always refer to the last thing you typed. So it's encrypted stuff. Which would then be decrypted again with whoever had the private key corresponding to the certificate. So if I was to unprotect it, it's going to be looking in my local certificate store again for the one that can magically decrypt it. So I just unencrypted it and we can take a look at Take a look at what it looks like. So this is just some regular CLI XML. And it breaks. So that's the great feature that we have, is to prevent you from doing these kind of things. So it would ideally work if it didn't break. So we'll take a look at that. But um, it does support the encryption and decryption of files. I think actually I know what I did. Anyways, so you can do it. Um, not right now, you can't, though. <laughs> now, wait wait wait, 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 wait for Jason to come by if you've got questions so we can hear you better. I just wanted to point out that this part is dependent on Windows 10 and it's been backported to um, Portal. So yeah. the, the CMS message commandlets are not dependent on Windows 10. They're in V5 and also the V4 update that we did. So this is all great and abstract and stuff, like, you're yeah, woohoo, I can encrypt stuff, but no one's ever said that. Really, the question is, I've got stuff that I really care about. So if you take a look at all that event log data, This is the kind of stuff that you might worry about. What happens if I've got all this wicked logging on the system, an attacker breaks in, and they just start pilfering my event log to see all the commands I've typed, all the sessions I've talked to, all the host names that I've been connecting to. This can be a thing that attackers can start to use to understand maybe the most sensitive parts of your, of your domain. So this is where you start to take all this great power where we've introduced the idea of protected event logging. So again, this is a simple registry key that you can set. PowerShell understands protected event logging. It's really a Windows feature. If you take a look at Windows 10, what you'll see is there is a new event logging node in the group policies that you can now start to push down protected event logging. What they require in terms of their input what they require in terms of their input is you simply say enable protected event logging and what's the certificate you want it to use. So that certificate, the same stuff that you saw with protected event logging, you can give it a thumbprint, you can give it a subject name, 
you can actually just encode the, when you export a certificate from the certificate provider, you can choose the their encoding with base64, paste that thing in there. You can give it a, a common file share with these certificates. So you don't have to set up a full on PKI if you don't want to. You can just deploy your certs through Goop policy. If you do want to, of course you can do that too. It'll look in the certificate provider for, the, for any cert that matches appropriately. Now once you set this up with group policy, let's take a look. And, and again, just to be clear, the enable protective analog is just a function that does the same thing that group policy would do. Correct, or a DSC configuration if you sent it out. Now the certificate is basically that, that two parameter. We're gonna enable the PowerShell script lock logging again. Again, group policy would be the way that you would do that for everyone. <coughs> so pretend that worked, pretend it was something you were really concerned about. Now you see all those same things that you previously saw have been encrypted. So you were able to send out this certificate to all of your machines. They're encrypting all your sensitive data. An attacker takes over this machine. They don't see anything. All they can see is this. What you've done is you've put your private certificate, your private key on, let's say, a centralized logger. And from that machine, you can start to analyze these events. And what does that look like? Now, of course, if the bad guy gets a hold of that private key, then... Right, if you've got a bad guy on your protected logger, uh, protected log collector, you're in some bad times. Yeah, make sure your resume's up to date. Yeah. <laughs> um, you mentioned a moment ago that in that group policy, you can actually put the, the Base 64 encoding is certificate, so you don't even have to worry about distribution. The, the group policy, the same one that enables the option, also distributes the cert. That's exactly, exactly. Really cool. Now, obviously, monkeying around with all this encrypted text is a severe pain. It'd be nice if you could just, like, you know, you saw how nice it was, like that pipelining of unprotect CMS message and stuff. So, what would happen if you did this? What would happen if you happen to magically have the certificate on your machine? What it did is it took a look at the mess, took a look that I had an event log coming in. It unprotected it for me and it showed the message. So if you're writing a consumer that's taking these things from a, a Windows event forwarding collector, you just write this stuff and you dump these things up into your SEM or something like that, rather than having to manually tweak around now, if you really wanted to keep all that extra data about who ran it and process these in another system, use include context. Actually, I took one step too far for you. So if you weren't thinking about security before the two hours ago, you probably will be now. Now here's an example where I just sent a, <clears throat> here's an example where I just sent a message to unprotect CMS message and it was able to, de to decode <coughs> Yeah. 
You see here, it was able to decode just from the context. It didn't need me, if I wanted to merge these things, what it did is it created a new PS object that looked just like an old event record, but it replaced the message with the unencrypted version of what used to be encrypted. So if you have already flows, you know, any tooling that's based, assuming on get win event and importing messages, this is very, very easy to just pipe in one new commandlet, unprotect CMS message on one side, and a new group policy, and now you've got a protected stream coming back and forth. Question. Well, Jason, does, does that uh, pipeline input and include context only work on event log objects, or can you pipe in anything, and does it just look at the properties for something that looks like CMS? The include context, if you passed in a big chunk of text, that had like plain text, plain text, plain text, then that little header for CMS message and then more plain text, what it will do is it will just replace that chunk with the unencrypted version of it. Okay, that's my new favorite thing. <laughs> there's, there's some smart code specifically around messages, around replacing them, with, uh, event log messages, replacing the message property. That's the only object type that it's like super magical for, but it, every plain text will be just brought in properly. Okay, we have about five more minutes for questions or anything else you want to say to me about CMS? So does, does, that, does that make sense? Are there any questions about CMS messages? Don, for the room. Thanks. So if I had a script and I wanted to embed some credentials in it and have those credentials only run, only one on, or run on one operation, but I just encrypt the operation and the credential, section of the script, or is that the wrong idea of how to use this? So the, the question would be, how do you make sure that a script that a user has can only run a specific operation? Yeah, with elevated credentials. So the, uh, with elevated credentials, the answer really there is around setting up a delegated admin endpoint. We've got some great answers there. Uh, Jeff Hicks. That, that was my session yesterday. Which is now on YouTube, so it's there. Um, we've got a lot of great sessions around Gia, which is a big effort we're doing to simplify that kind of scenario. Really the thing to think about is if somebody can encrypt the data, if a script can do it, then so can the person running the script. So you really need to really be thinking about who is your attacker. Hey, just a follow up to Steve's question. What if you try to use like credential roaming for a service account? to then replicate their credentials. And are you thinking about this in general or around the protect CMS message so question? be able to protect you know, your login and the script that would be used throughout the organization. So yeah, really, um, it really comes down to the same question of the only way to protect credentials is to not ever give them out and to put them behind a constrained endpoint that people can connect to, anybody can connect to, but within that constrained endpoint, it will be running under elevated credentials. And there is great support from PowerShell in that. It's, it's not from encrypting with the CMS message commandlets. Right, because then the person connected to the endpoint, they have no idea who they're running as, they don't really care. When you set it up, you care, but then you don't have to deal, no one has to think about what password I put in, how do I put in credentials, that's all off the table. They would be able to decrypt it if if they need to run a PowerShell command, at some point the PowerShell process needs to decrypt it, take those credentials and then log on to another system with those credentials. If PowerShell is able to do that, so is the user. All it takes is somebody turning on script lock logging, and they can see every single phase of the process. So. A question up front here, Jason. <laughs> I was just wondering about using it to protect like the passwords in a DSC. I think and that's something that would be that I think a usage that would work. Yes, uh, definitely protecting passwords in a DSC configuration. If what you're worried about is somebody taking over your pull server and seeing those passwords. 
if you're worried about the passwords sitting around in the configuration when it's sitting on that end machine, you're still kind of back to this situation of if the, post, if the DSC local configuration manager can read those passwords, then so can anybody running as an administrator on that machine. Well, yeah, on, on the end, you know, during the creation process, you have the people who put the password into an encrypted file for, yes. say, the, the SQL SA password. And they, yep. want to, they want to keep that so that only the machine that actually builds the config, which exactly. might be an automated one, it has the, the key. But those of us who actually work on the configs don't have the ability to be correct. Yep, yep. So, absolutely. the. the DSC already has the capability to do that around credentials. Anything that you mark as a secure string, already DSC supports the idea of encrypting and decrypting to public keys. If you want to do other configuration data that you consider secure that DSC doesn't right now annotate as secure, this is the kind of technique that you would use. How many of you have a head that hurts right now? <laughs> All right, so. Um, Obviously, you know, we're around for the couple, next couple days. Uh, we're going to break for lunch. Hope you found this informative. Thank you, Lee. Thank you. And <laughs> one other. One other. Oh.